Hello everyone and welcome back to My Old Hands. Today I'm joined by a gentleman that it's been a few years since I've spoken to, but he's one of the people whose content I follow the most and that I enjoy the most. So I'm here today with podcaster, microphone enthusiast, and the founder of Podcastage, which is this incredible, if you're a mic nerd, YouTube channel, the great Bantry Scott. Welcome to the show, Bantry. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. I am absolutely honored that you invited me to be on. The honor's mine. And let's just dive straight in because I was just listening to something of yours. And I did tell Bandrew beforehand because I listened to audio faster. I wanted to make sure I knew what Bandrew sounded like at normal speed in person, in real life. So you were talking about the value of physical media. And this is something, and it's probably been a hill that I've been accused of dying on, but I believe that at least in some part of our lives, we should hang on to some form of physical media. So before I go on my diatribe, can you tell us what's special about physical media to you and why maybe you still purchase it and you still use it? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. The first one is strictly an access reason. So there have been many times where I've purchased a digital copy of a movie and then the service I purchased that from loses the rights to it. So even though I paid 15 or 20 bucks, I can no longer watch that. And that just got under my skin. It just drove me crazy. I gave you money, but I don't own it. So that was one of the main reasons. But over the last couple of years, I've come to appreciate the tangibility or the, the intention that's required to appreciate or enjoy a piece of physical media. Because with streaming services, you just have access to everything. If you're bored after five minutes, I'll switch on to a different album. I don't like the order of this album, so I'll just skip around. I didn't like the start of that show. I'll go watch another movie instead. But with a piece of physical media, you're getting up off your rear end, walking over to the console and putting in a DVD or putting in a CD to your stereo and listening that way. So that intention kind of forces you to appreciate it a little bit more. And that's what I've really enjoyed over the last couple of years. That makes complete sense. And you've covered some of the same territory that probably I would. But you hinted on the intentionality of a piece of physical media. And I remember when I first got told by my little brother that I would like Battlestar Galactica, the 2004 version, and how unbelievable the first episode 33 is. He said, just give it a chance. If you don't like that first episode, I can't help you because- (laughs) <laughs> this is a show made for you, Josh. It is your show. And where I live in Australia, we had several retailers, but none of them had all of the copies. So I spent half a day traveling around town, buying all of the seasons because the show had completed by that point on DVD at the time. And when I think about why Battlestar is important to me, I mean, I love the first season. I think as a encapsulation, it's one of the best seasons of any art I've ever seen. But it's more about what it took for me to initialize my fandom of that genre. Very rarely can you replicate that in any form of digital environment. Like I remember going to the shop. I remember the few people who served me. These people had no idea what Battlestar Galactica was besides they thought it was the old show from the 70s. Like there's memories imbued in those physical discs that come back to me every time I go to play them. And there's also the drift factor, which you mentioned. There's some really hard, and I guess not banal, because all the episodes are pretty good, particularly in season two and three, there's some tough episodes to get through because it's rolling out multiple storylines. And I guess your modern word for it would be just slow. And they're the sorts of things on streaming I find myself skipping. But then I'm taking away some of the artistic integrity of what they were trying to achieve by skipping through the hard moments because I couldn't be bothered. That I also can't do. If I've got to get up, I'll sit through it (laughs) and I'll experience those tough moments. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point about having these memories associated with these physical discs. I still remember, that just reminded me, in 2003, I had to go to four different Best Buys, which is an electronic store here in the States, to buy the from first to last album, Dear Diary, My Teen Angst Bullshit Has a Body Count. I had to go to four different... Best buys to find that. And I still remember doing that. And I listened to it for a week straight. 
If, if it was just on streaming, I would not remember that. I would have just said, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, that's fine. And then moved on. It's funny. We've got a lot to get to today, guys, who are listening, but we're on a, <laughs> we're on a tangent here, and I love tangents. So <laughs> I remember when I made a trip down to Melbourne, which is about three and a half hours away from where I live, and that was one of our two major cities, I guess you'd say, in Australia. And I went to this really special record shop where I could get a lot of stuff that I was into. And on the same day, I purchased In Keeping Secrets of a Silent Earth by Coheed and Cambria. Coheed and Cambria. An album by a band called Open Hand, which I can't remember the name of that album, but it's one of the greatest one album band albums of all time. It was incredible. I'll, I'll send you a link to that band, Drew, because it's a really stunning album. And one of my favourite albums of all time, which was Finch's Say Hello to Sunshine. I bought all of those in one trip. And I had to go. There was no, I mean, I could have ordered them somehow to where I live. May or may not have turned up. But it was more about the trip. I, I got on a train. I went down there. I went to the shop. They were all there somehow. And the open hand one was just sitting near the Finch album. And the guy in the shop said, oh, if you like them, you'll probably like this band because they're kind of weird and unique in that similarish genre. So I had two CDs I wanted and one that I'd never heard about because I got to meet another human in a physical space who put it in my hand mm. and said, buy this one too. And I'm not sure that the suggested algorithms on Amazon are quite that friendly or helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't trust a robot too much. I would much <laughs> rather listen to the kind of snobby, elitist music nerd at the record shop. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had their value. So, yeah. so why Bandra is actually on the show today, we're not just going to talk about CDs and physical media, but I thought it was important to get that out of the way. One last thing that I will say is that I think in the future we need to find a way in the digital space to replicate the fragility of digital only, I'm oh, sorry, of a physical thing in digital. Because when I lent someone Enema by Tool, which is my favorite album, if I lent that to them, it was in a certain condition and I wanted it back in that condition. And they had to not only care about the music and or make a decision whether they liked it or not, but they had to care for the physical thing to then be able to return it to me. And that was kind of that full circle. And I don't yeah. see how we can share things around as easily, I don't know, with that kind of fragility. I, I haven't really articulated it how – I just remember it was really special when you would lend something to someone and it was physical and then they would give it back to you and you could tell they'd looked after it. Yeah, like, I don't know if you had that experience or that hits home for you. I never really had too many CDs. Most of the stuff that I had was like burned. So I wasn't as precious with it because it, it ended up just being, I don't want to say throwaway, yeah. but it was only very special CDs. And most of the time, my friends, we just played in a band together. So we would just get in the same room and listen to it. I wouldn't really be lending it around to people at school or anything. Nobody else really liked us. <laughs> I feel like, I guess for me, it was because I was like the center of my friend's direct music taste because mm -hmm. I was actively going and finding these physical things and bringing them back into our world. It actually allowed me to have a little place in the friendship group that I was handing out yeah. the Finch album and I was handing out, say, the Coheed album again, and Alexis on Fire, watch out. Like I was handing out these albums at the time. And I were kind of circling amongst the friendship group. So, with all that said, that's enough about me. We're going to talk about Bandrew now. So, you had this incredible YouTube channel, Podcastage, which we'll talk a little bit about. But I was actually hoping we maybe could talk more about Bandrew Says today or Says, depending how you want to say that. So, that is your more personal show and it's the one that I listen to more regularly. How would you describe to someone that's never heard the program what it is? So it has gone through a number of iterations. Actually, I want to back up and say thank you for those kind words about podcast. It's very nice of you. It means a lot. But with the Bander Says podcast, that was, it was started as a reason for me to talk about tech news. And I kind of fell out of love with that. And now really what it has become is me discussing content creator news or social media news. And trying to present it in a way that somebody who also creates content can understand how it may impact them. But then it also developed and I tried to get more interaction with people. And 
it seems like 50% of the show is now people saying, hey, how does this microphone sound in this situation? And I end up doing audio gear tests. So it's a mix of me demoing or testing or answering audio related questions, as well as analyzing content creator news. Okay, so there's the kind of the two big buckets there. And you also mentioned that you get a lot of engagement, which is something I wanted to talk about for people listening that are in creative fields. You seem to have empowered your audience on some level to feel confident to send you lots of different kinds of questions and you try your best to answer those. So we'll get back to that. But what is creator news? Like I could put that into YouTube now and get a bunch of people trying to sell me a 12-step program on how to launch a YouTube (laughs) channel and whatever else and make sure every two seconds check the affiliate links, guys, make sure you sign up to my program. You're all doing something very different. So is that still the most accurate term for what you do? Is it more like creator truth or what, what, what's yeah, the I, differentiation? I would, still, I would still say it's creator news because I don't think there's anything newsworthy about somebody selling a 12-step program. That's not news. That's <laughs> a sales pitch. Mm. But as far as creator news, that would be Twitter is rolling out monetization. Here is what the requirements are. Here is how this may benefit you. Can you gain access to this? Or YouTube changing their algorithm. I've been doing a lot of discussions and testing there to see what we as individuals may actually be able to impact. I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. Not much. We don't have much impact on it at all. It's just a crapshoot. And these these YouTube gurus, they they seem to have all the answers. None of their answers <laughs> seem to work for me. So make of that what you will. But I still think creator news is a proper term for it. Even if somebody else may have co-opted it, it's still, I'd still say it's accurate. Yeah. And I, I do agree. And I think sometimes if you disagree with the general consensus on advice in a particular artistic field, which I'm known to do in the audio podcast world, <laughs> you can you can be seen as being intentionally a contrarian and maybe you're also wrong so people don't take you seriously. Somehow you've managed to maybe have some contrarian opinions but also you're presenting it with enough warmth and respect to most of the general views of YouTube that people don't just see, oh, he's just the angry guy in the corner that disagrees with everything. I've never viewed myself as an expert on anything. This is going to sound crazy to a lot of people, but I want to be the dumbest person in the room. (laughs) I want to be surrounded by people that are smarter than me because that means I can learn from every single one of them. So I have no problem being wrong, but because I understand that I am kind of a dummy sometimes, I'm not going to present my ideas or my opinions as the end-all be-all, as the fact. That's why I am such a big advocate on the in the audio gear space as here are all the tests make up your own mind and if you disagree with me awesome i don't care if you love how you sound on a microphone that i dislike as long as you're happy with it and as long as people find it listenable that's all that matters my opinion really doesn't matter because it is your gear it is your production and it is reliant on your opinion so that's how i pretty much approach everything (laughs) Yeah. And the funny, I guess, contradiction for the lack of a better term is that your perspective on this is just my opinion, take it or leave it. It may not matter what I feel as long as you're happy with what you're creating has actually opened a door where people feel confident to reach out to you for your direct opinion now. It's because you've got out with the intention (laughs) of share with me your feelings on what I'm doing or what you're doing. We can have a dialogue here. And it's made a really nice channel and a lot of Andrew's show, as he mentioned, and it goes up and down maybe in the amount of time you spend on it. But you do have regular feedback and it's not the same three people every episode asking you similar questions. It's lots of varied kinds of questions. Was that something that's developed over time? And how comfortable were you that you started getting that amount of feedback? It has developed over time and it comes in waves. There are times where I'll get a lot of submissions, times where I don't. So there are two sections of feedback and the first feedback or the first form of engagement that I started including was what you had to say. And that's basically just 
taking interesting comments from the comment section on YouTube and discussing them further. I get 20, 30 comments each episode, so there's typically a handful of very interesting comments that can lead to interesting discussions for the, for, <laughs> for the sake of saying interesting five dozen times. <laughs> then I implemented something called Ask Bandrew, where I let people send in more in-depth questions, and I actually ask them to send in audio and video. That's a lot more difficult, and that's the one that comes in a lot more waves. So I, I set that up two different ways. Email, they can send in the audio, lossless, they can send in video, as well as SpeakPipe, I think that's what it's called. And it lets people record their audio and just send it through a little plugin on a site. So there's all this feedback coming in and obviously not all of it's positive. <laughs> so is, mm -hmm. there any, is there any through lines in the types of positive comments that you receive and or the negative ones? Because you don't have the mainstream YouTube creative view on everything. Like some of the things you say are maybe run a slightly contrary to what people would hear elsewhere. Yeah, I've had some some topics I've discussed that have not been popular. <laughs> the The one that comes to mind is retailers embedding my videos on their websites and essentially gaining benefit from it, monetary benefit from it, but not asking permission, not compensating, nothing. And I was saying this feels kind of wrong to me. But it seems like the overwhelming consensus is, no, you're just being a baby. You have embedding enabled, allow it. I was like, it still seems wrong. Why are they essentially using my video, getting the benefit of the demonstrations, and ultimately making a sale off of my work when I see nothing from that? It seems a bit wrong. So I got a lot of pushback on that. <laughs> okay. And what was the... I guess what was, once again, the through line of the pushback that you should appreciate that these big websites chose your video of all the videos to put on there. They could have, they could have done it themselves and you'd get none of that extra traffic. Is that the main there argument? Were, there, were t there were two <laughs> arguments there. One was, yes, you're getting views. You should be grateful for that. The second one is you made these videos to help people make more informed decisions the video being on their website is helping somebody make a more informed purchasing decision. So it's fulfilling the goal you set out to do. Mm. And I understand that, but at the same time, I don't like somebody else profiting off of my work without mm. my approval. There's still something that feels icky to me. I think, I think the ickiness is justified because to not even actually be informed maybe that that was happening. I don't know how you found out that this is happening. People are either telling you or you're seeing traffic related stuff in some kind of analytic in YouTube. I'm not that au fait with YouTube to know that, but now there's a certain ickiness to it that they could have let you know. This is a sales page for this product and we're going to use your particular YouTube video and embed that. I think that that's a fair argument. Obviously, people didn't agree with you though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not very much. And there's been plenty of YouTube policies because I tend to support a lot of decisions that YouTube makes, or at least I give them the benefit of the doubt. And a lot of people just automatically assume YouTube is making the worst decision ever. They're evil. They're out to destroy creators. They're out to murder a viewer's family. I don't know. <laughs> People seem to assume the absolute worst, but I just say, okay, here's the real reason why they're doing it, at least from my perspective. So I think it's okay that they're testing it. They're going to find out they're wrong, but it's not the worst thing in the world that they're, they're testing the limits. Yeah, which makes complete sense. And it, it is weird that a lot of people who talk about YouTube and talk about podcasting and all these things they also spend most of the time complaining about everything that's wrong with it. I think, can't we just be, ex can't we, if people are discovering you because they're a newer person to the space, can't they find something more positive when they first discover the thing than a bunch of people saying, this is the 10 <laughs> things wrong with YouTube today? Like, yeah, I, I understand that because you criticize something that you love because you want it to improve. YouTube mm -hmm. is, 
in my opinion, the greatest website ever made. They still do stuff wrong. There is still stuff that can improve. So I understand people criticizing it. I just think the level of criticism is sometimes unfair. And a lot of people seem to come across maybe a bit curmudgeonly. They seem a bit entitled. Mm. Because I before YouTube was around, if I wanted to have a video online, I had to pay for hosting space. I needed to learn how to use an FTP server upload thing. I had to pay for the bandwidth. I had to find a video player plugin that was compatible with as many people as possible. It was a lot of work and it was very expensive. So in 2005, <laughs> when I heard about this site that lets you upload for free, you didn't have to pay bandwidth costs. I was gobsmacked. Yeah. Yeah, that's revelatory, really, particularly because yeah. at the time... And it's what one thing I wanted to get to today. You were playing music. And was that one of the first reasons you wanted to put video on the internet for your band or your music career? Was that why you first went out to find an option, maybe pre-YouTube? Yeah, the first videos that I made were for my band. They were just playing music. They They were also my friends just goofing around. It was this, hey, we have these little cameras we're having fun and the process of making videos is exciting to us. So we just did that. I, I remember the first time I got a Mac and it was a lot easier for me to edit. I had a little point and shoot camera that did video. I would edit together videos of me doing like karate in a, like in a wolf mask. It was the <laughs> dumbest stuff that has ever existed, but it was funny to me. It was funny yeah. to my friends and we just did the silliest stuff because we could do it. It was this new medium that we were exploring. And with the, the band that you're in or the music that you're playing, I don't think I've ever heard you quite talk about that in depth, which is one of the main things I wanted to talk about today, that path from musician and that kind of creator into video. So we'll just park that for one second. Did you have any goal for these videos besides just creating them for the sake of creating them and having fun? And also, just for people that are listening, I almost spat out my water during that wolf story. So, <laughs> uh, if you're going to tell me, just give me a like a, a wave when you're going to say something funny, Bandrew, so I can't take a sip of water. <laughs> okay. Well, just for the record, I will never say anything funny again. <laughs> okay. So, there was no goal behind making these videos. It was strictly for fun. Mm. We we made a... Okay. There was one goal. Hey, we're, we, ha we just recorded an, an EP, not an album four songs. We want to make a little video of live shows mixed together with us goofing around at hotels, freezing boxers outside and putting them on, acting like complete idiots. We think that'll be funny for a music band. And then we can use that on our MySpace page and use it to get some attention so people might come to our shows. That was one goal. But then I'm going to record a cover of From First to Last's Emily on the acoustic guitar. I had no goal with that. It was just because I loved this song, I learned how to play it. And prior to YouTube existing, I would look at tab websites and I created a few tabs and uploaded them. And this was a way of me just playing it. And people could look at my hand and maybe learn it that way as well and hear it. So it was that's just awesome. the pure joy out of it. And that's something we do need to remember always, the pure joy. Because rarely, and that can be seen as esoteric, Particularly on YouTube, I've found that anyone who's out there talking about the joy of something, the comments are half full of, oh, that's fine if you don't have 30 things going on for the week and you don't have 45 <laughs> kids. I've got to be efficient, man. <laughs> like that can be. I, I think everybody could use a little bit less stress. Well, that's easier said than done. I think everybody could use a bit more joy in their life and they could take things a little bit less seriously. Everybody is so wound up nowadays and that little bit of joy can save somebody <laughs> like i got asked recently what i'm trying to do as a comedian because i've started doing stand-up a few years ago and i'm like i'm not trying to do anything besides hang out with funny people try to make people laugh and then get a massive buzz the goal is not beyond those things and i can't see that changing for the immediate to midterm future i just want to get good and enjoy the experience and I don't know whether I'd never even contemplated if I needed a goal beyond that until this person asked me and then that got buried in my head Bandrew they put their 
<laughs> stress of why are you wasting your time doing that unless there's some big end goal into my brain. That's okay. That's the biggest load of crap. You need to have some goal because why can't you just have a hobby that you enjoy that is fun for you that lets you unwind? Making a video on YouTube, going and doing stand up, going and golfing or playing frisbee golf, whatever the heck people do. I completely agree. It's a, it's a, that's a big topic. We might go back to that later. Actually, I'll, I'll memory bank that one. So the band. I'm not sure how much you want to talk about that period and maybe the fact you haven't in the past was that for some reason you don't want to, but I'm going to pressure <laughs> you a little bit to talk about it today. So maybe you don't have to tell us what the band was called, but what genre were you in? How much touring did you do? Who did you maybe play with that you weren't ever expecting to maybe get to share <laughs> the stage with? So, Okay, yeah. So in high school, it was more pop punk and then in college, it went to post-hardcore and then that progressed into metal. And that's just as musical tastes expand and get deeper into the esoteric, to bring back that word, getting into the more obscure stuff. And as far as touring, we did a handful of tours in the southwest of the United States. We did California a number of times. We went through Texas. We went through Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah. And that's about it as far as touring. We stayed in the Southwest. As far as the bands we played with, I was thinking about this the other day. One of the most shocking ones for me was, I don't know what they would be called, Grindcore, but the band is called Ed Gein, named after the serial killer. And <laughs> I don't know if you've played with hardcore and metal bands, but... Growing up, I was always scared of them, <laughs> and I was terrified to go and play this show with this incredibly heavy grindcore band. But they were incredibly nice. They were incredibly kind. The fans, the crowd was incredibly nice, and I don't think anybody got hurt. Two of the nicest people I've ever met in the music scene was the guitarist from a hardcore band called Mind Snare from Melbourne, and the next person was the drummer of a band called Psychroptic who is a band from Tasmania here in Australia, but he's like a world-renowned super tech drummer. I mean, if he had a YouTube channel and they were massive 10, 15 years ago, he would be that guy that's exploding on TikTok doing all the covers because he's that technically yeah. brilliant. <laughs> he, not, one of the nicest people I've ever met. It's yeah. funny, you would, you would know that some of the nicest people around and gentlest are these people in these bands that scare people. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think it's because they've kind of been alienated so they know what it's like to be an outsider and they know how much it can mean to be kind to somebody. So I yeah. think that's why you see so many people in the hardcore and metal scene who play this scary music because, yeah, they're kind of angry. But mm. simultaneously, they understand the difficulty that everybody has. Yeah. So I think that's why we see that dichotomy. So when you describe that area, because obviously America as Martin Atkins, who's a famous drummer from Public Image Limited, said, America's effing big. That probably felt like a small <laughs> area to you. But there's parts of the world where you just described half a, half a continent's worth of area. When you, were, <laughs> yeah. when you were out on the road, what role were you playing on the road? Well, to start with, sorry, Andrew, what instrument did you play in the band? And did you have any responsibilities beyond just stagecraft and playing your instrument? Were you managing? Were you driving a lot? So I played the guitar. I did a little bit of backing vocals, but I was never the greatest vocalist. So I let the other people do that and I just supported them on occasion. I didn't have a driver's license at the time, so I did not drive at all, which was great for me. <laughs> and yeah. as I've gotten older, I've learned that I have some eye issues. So probably good that I wasn't driving because we probably wouldn't all be alive. Okay. But as far as my role outside of that, I think that the main thing was I would do all of the social media. I would do the promotion on MySpace. I would make the website. I would do my best to book stuff. I failed at it miserably sometimes, but I did the booking, the promotion, the social media stuff. And I did a lot of writing as well. That, that was my main thing. And then I'd bring ideas and then everybody would add their magic and add additional parts and all of that. Excellent. So just to wind up the band chats, 
you kind of morphed part of your musical history and songwriting craft and the ability to sing a little bit, as you said, into what you do with the podcast each channel because you're not just talking about voice-related microphone stuff. You're also referencing in one section how it performs on the acoustic guitar, the electric guitar, etc. Do you get any pushback from people that just want the voice or just want the music in your micro reviews? I Initially, I did. Initially, I would get comments saying, hey, you suck at singing. Why are mm-hmm. you doing that? Hey, you suck at guitar. Your tone is terrible. Why are you doing that? And I just said, people ask me to do it, so I'm going to do it. I give you timestamps in every single description. If you don't want to watch it, I make it so incredibly easy for you to skip over it. Skip over it. This video is meant to be as useful for as many people as possible, so I try to include as much as I can. If you don't see value in a certain part, skip over it. So for people that are listening, how Bandrew's micro reviews normally roll out on the podcast each channel is that he goes into the microphone physically and then the specs of the mic and then transitions into, I guess, a more musician-centric little element and you can skip around and see all those things. But for me, it's what delineated you the most from any microphone review channel. I mean, you can't, no one can walk onto a mic and sound like Mike Delgadio. Like we don't all, right. when very few of us are blessed to be able to just, that's our differentiator. We're just so great <laughs> that we could just walk onto the mic and be great. That was something to me that's like, oh, this guy understands that creativity might stretch beyond YouTube and beyond podcasting. This person might have this mic for 30 years. They might be a musician from back in the day and they rediscover music. I've got a way to record now. I can do that. Do you think that comes from having that music background, that you have enough confidence to actually include that? And have you thought about at any point, should I have that in there? Because I'm assuming it's a lot of extra work. Yeah, I I have considered all of that. So- (laughs) I didn't initially have the music test in my reviews. I had played music before YouTube, but people said, hey, I see a guitar in the background. Why aren't you including a test with a guitar? Mm. So it was through comments that I started including it. So that's why I initially started sharing that, why I started adding that in, because people were asking for it. As far as leaving it in and considering taking it out, I have looked at analytics and during the music section, that's when I have a massive fall off in retention. People just skip over it. (laughs) So I'm spending hours upon hours writing this and making sure I'm setting the mics up properly and recording it, editing the video files together. Ultimately, where I lose 15, 20% of the audience. So I started thinking, do I need to include this? Should I break it out and upload it to a second channel? Because with YouTube, it's a terrible way to look at things. And it's why I didn't end up breaking it out. But thinking, okay, if if retention is so important for the algorithm, should I leave it in knowing it harms retention? Because that's going to harm the performance of the video. It's kind of like Mm -hmm. that comedian saying, hey, what's your goal? Why are you doing this? And me thinking of the YouTube algorithm, why am I including this? It's hurting the video. But then I realized I don't care. I'm doing this to help somebody make a decision. And that is going to be helpful for a certain amount of people. I'm going to keep it in. Heck it. I like that perspective. And I'll give you an example of something I did recently that eh, probably didn't work the way I wanted by including a lot of my personality in something. But as time rolls out and maybe that video becomes less relevant, It probably won't for an RE20 or an SM7B, but it might for some microphone that's some fly-by-night USB mic that might be changed or revised (laughs) or disappeared in two years from now. Mm -hmm. Having that music stuff in there means in and of itself, it's an artistic statement for you. Here's all the things that I would do with a microphone and all the creativity I've got to give you. And that makes the actual thing you created valuable, even if what you're talking about is antiquated or degradated if the company decides to move away from it. So I think that that's cool that you're leaving it in, even if the analytics say no, because you're creating something, hopefully, that over time just has value in and of itself because you made it. I had never considered it. I have never considered that, but that's a great way to look at it. And I like that a lot. I'm probably way too esoteric about this stuff, but (laughs) 
that's how I see it. That for you as the artist, you've made a thing and you didn't compromise on that thing. Whether it's as useful for people in the future or not, that can change. But I, I've got a little show about podcasting and I tend to upset people. I think that's probably why it never grows because I disagree with nearly everything most shows about audio podcasting tend to say, at least a little bit. And I included some jokes that I wrote. They weren't even really great jokes. So like little tiny crazy things that I wrote in about five seconds and put them into a text editor and then recorded the AI voice speaking back to me. And that's the only feedback I've had for that show recently. It was, oh, that was funny, but I, it was a bit weird. Like I got that, like the backhanded <laughs> compliment. Like, oh, the joke, the joke was okay and the references were a bit wild, but I'm not sure that that's really who you are. I'm like, no, that is exactly who I am. <laughs> I put more of me in there, not less. So I ended up cutting the episode together because it was a multi-part interview and then I cut all that stuff out and put it back out. And none of those same people went back and checked it out. Like right. I was thinking, I've just I've given them the thing that they asked for, which is to stick it all together, get rid of all this crazy intro and out- outro AI dumb jokes that you wrote and just give us the content and- it didn't exactly blow up, Bandrew. It didn't take over the world because right. I took because I took myself out of it. If anything, it was fell a bit flat. That's the difficult thing: trying to provide value for people and not waste their time, while also ensuring that you are being truthful to yourself or honest with yourself or putting yourself into the content that you're making. Mm-hmm. Because that that's something that I'm pretty sure every single podcaster or YouTube struggles with. Do I need to redo, re-record this introduction because I didn't get to the point fast enough? I talked too much about my day. I would re-record it. But some people say, you're an idiot. That's what we want to hear. Mm. So those people may have just been the very vocal minority when that's really what makes your show special. You. Yeah. There are plenty of shows about podcasting. But people come to your show because they want to hear Josh's take on it. They want to hear Josh's personality come through. Yeah, I agree. And I think it was, I just left it all out there. So you can either hear these little bits with the funny AI bits. I mean, and I thought they were okay, considering I, it wasn't like jokes I've been working on, like my stand up for three years. These, right. are things, <laughs> these are things I wrote literally two seconds before I put them into the AI speech thing. So, yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty dumb. I'll send you one if you want to check it out so you know exactly what I'm talking Absolutely. about. It's probably hard to in, for people to envisage how dumb these jokes were. But I think about a show like Mark Maron. I've really found him hard as a personality to get into when I was listening to his show originally. But I loved Bill Burr and I loved some of the people from Hollywood he was talking about. I liked everything about Maron's show except for him. <laughs> and okay, like, and his show starts off for fifteen to sixteen minutes of just Marin, but over time I realised that I started to like him more and the guests less. And it wasn't that I liked the guests mm. less in that I felt some other way about them. I just appreciated him more. And having a lot of, I guess, having a lot of yourself in something that may take people longer to get used to and to get into, but it's really the only differentiator we have is how much of ourself is in a thing. Yeah, and if Mark is being himself at the beginning of the show and somebody doesn't like that, would Mark really want that person listening anyway? Sure, you may not, you may limit the potential audience, but you're creating or allowing people to become more intimately engaged with you, to become a deeper fan or a deeper audience member because now they understand you better They understand why you have these quirks. Oh, because you were an alcoholic, because you were addicted to drugs. Okay, we get it. We understand why you're the way that you are now. It kind of makes you think that when you get feedback about certain things too, that you can't change about yourself. Sometimes I found myself obsessing about that. Like Mark Maron is an angry person who's disappointed with the world regularly. Not having that in there, you wouldn't actually be listening to him if some of the things you find annoying weren't in there you'd be listening to someone else. Like I remember when I, one of the very earliest comments that I received for an early music show that I was doing was, you don't have the worst Australian accent I've ever heard, but I'd rather be <laughs> listening to something else. Because, I mean, that's something that literally, I mean, and my Australian accent, to be honest, 
has it's changed over the last 10 years because I've spent so long talking onto a microphone, so much time. And probably the fact that I'm listening to people from around the world way more than I used to. I've got more accent blend in my head. That was like a not even a backhanded compliment. That was, for what it is, it's okay, but it still kind of sucks. Because you can't change something that you basically were born with, and that's that you grew up in a place <laughs> and you have the accent of that place. Well, that person's clearly a dickhead, oh, or or yeah. or as yeah, so- as a, a Kiwi would say, a dickhead. A dickhead. Stop yes, being so- such a dickhead. <laughs> but do you remember somebody who sounds generic? Somebody who sounds like everybody else? No. We recognize the people who have unique voices, unique accents. So. You sound like Josh. Yeah. I would much rather you sound like Josh than the 50,000 other Joe Blows who sound exactly the same. Mm. We we listen to Johnny Cash because he's, well, for many reasons, but his voice is so unique. Yeah. He's not a good singer, no. but his voice is unique. Yeah. It's a truth and a tone in his voice. Yeah. And- I guess where I was kind of going with that, Andrew, is, and I don't know whether you've had this experience, that sometimes though, you can, whether you want to let it get into you or not, like we'd all like to think we've got a shield up against dumb shit, like, oh, change your mm-hmm. accent. Well, sorry, I could do that, but we're not all Arnold Schwarzenegger that are, you know, we're not all worth hundreds of millions of dollars and can get an accent <laughs> coach. Like, this is what it is, and it may fluctuate and be, maybe over time be tempered slightly, but it's always going to be there. But I still fixated on that a little bit. And it was more so extrapolation. Uh, am I limited because of my accent? Regardless how good I get at audio or whatever it is I'm doing, is there an inbuilt bias against just the way that I sound in general? And I'm building all this up in my own head. Right. Like, like just from that one comment, and my brain tends to do that, it just escalates. But I don't know. Do you have any moments where you've got obsessed with something that doesn't matter? Oh, absolutely. Especially with comments. It's- mm. Every single person on the internet, yeah, we try to build up walls. We try to build a shield. And you may be able to do it for 99 of the comments, but that last one, that 100th negative comment, just cuts you to the core, especially if it's something that you are already self-conscious about. Then it really bothers you and it, it buries itself deep in there and starts to gnaw away at you. So, yeah, everybody struggles with that. And there have been many things. It's, it's why I have tried to avoid calling myself an expert. I don't think I have ever once referred to myself as an audio engineer because I'm not. And I know that would be an attack vector for somebody. So I intentionally approach things a certain way to try to limit the potential attack vectors <laughs> of the comments on YouTube. And that's probably not the healthiest way to approach things, but it's kind of a defense mechanism. You kind of need that. I, I completely agree. I think about that sometimes when I'm doing TikTok. I'll film it on a certain angle so there's nothing in the background and it's got a certain, I guess, my most flattering angle, which I had a female friend tell me, like, if you're going to film, film from this angle if you want to get the most flattering angle. That's all about limiting attack vectors. Mm-hmm. Shit that probably doesn't truly matter as much as just make the thing and put it out. If you're getting yeah. too hung up on this early stuff, all this vectoring, <laughs> yeah, then maybe you're not actually going to put the thing out. But in, in the end, as you get better at making stuff, better in the sense that able to overcome that shit, I think that that works. So, which is something you've certainly done. So, I'm talking about myself a lot today, which I find weird and I don't know why that's happened, but I want to get back no, on I you. No, I love it. <laughs> I want to get back on you. So, we've kind of hinted at the guru space, the YouTube growth space at times, and you know that I'm a I like to go after those people, particularly in the podcasting world. Does your audience ever push you for more generic information along those lines? Or have you curated a group of people that knows that's not where we go to hear that generic stuff? No, not really. I haven't had people asking me, hey, how do I grow my channel? Over the last couple of months, I've been exploring this Mm. simply out of curiosity. Nobody asked for it. I just thought, hey, this is kind of interesting to me. I want to see if any of these analytics that I've heard people say are so important are actually important. 
So I'm just kind of exploring what other people have said. And I've just found, yeah, it's all kind of bullshit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> None of it really matters. Yeah, okay. I, I have I have asked people to make this video blow up. Okay, I want a thousand dislikes on this video. I think I ended up with like 500 dislikes and 50 likes, something like that. Mm. That video did surprisingly well. <laughs> Okay. So maybe getting a super disliked video helps. It yep. doesn't. It was just the topic. That's really what it seems to come down to. If your video is interesting to a larger number of people, a larger number of people are going to watch it. Yep. That's that's fascinating. But I want to run something by you, Bandra. I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to go into my phone to read this. Do you ever get feedback that's like this? And why do you think people are like this? If you have even the slightest little bit of like, juiced up anger, like kind of that Bill Burrish, like I'm going to pretend to be angry about something that's not really important, which I did yesterday on TikTok. I made a quick TikTok reel about how people that buy tiny houses, they're always talking about how amazing their tiny house is, but it's always on some beautiful vista over a lake or it's always at the top of a cliff or it's always on a beach. And all it was was maybe if they spent a little bit less on the land, they could afford a bigger house. And most people liked it. <laughs> and obviously, it's a ridiculous premise. It's just me being stupid. I just think it's funny that they're always in these beautiful locations, but they're the size of a portable toilet. Like, I don't really yeah. get that. But one of the first comments I got was, and I get this regularly when I'm doing these fake anger videos, who hurt you? What happened to you? <laughs> Do you get those people that just assume that everything you're saying is serious and they truly, they're either concerned or they're not concerned and they're just being dickheads? I don't get comments like specifically like that saying, hey, who hurt you? But I do get people who, because I mainly just review audio gear, that, that's where the main audience and the main engagement is. The The podcast is kind of a, it's developed a very curated audience who comes because they already know who I am. Yep. So they're a bit kinder. But with reviews, I do encounter people who are angry because I say something negative about a microphone that they own. And it's because they seem to associate the gear they have with their self-worth. Oh, yeah. So that's the, that's the closest that I can say I've encountered to that. But it's, I, I'm assuming it's a similar underlying issue. This person may have some kind of tiny house. Maybe they bought into that. Maybe they've wanted to do that for a long time. And you're just saying, hey, don't live on a $5 million piece of land and then you can buy a nice house. Because still be a nice piece of land. You're just not going to look over the ocean. Yeah. So exactly. maybe they feel personally <laughs> attacked. Their self-worth is degraded yeah. because you disagree with something that they have longed for forever. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it is. Yeah. I don't think there's an answer to that one. I just found that really funny. But a lot of the YouTube channels that I follow, if they are in the tech space or the music space, like I watched this show called That Pedal Show and it's an incredible oh, show yeah. about guitar pedals. And a lot of the comments will be, why do you hate this so much? Like where did this hatred come from for this thing? And I think it's right. They either own it or they've dreamt about owning it or they want it or it's something they've built up in their head and they've attached some self-worth to the thing. But I let that comment bother me a tiny little bit of, oh, did I not present that in a comedic way? Did I actually sound mean? And then you go look at the people's profiles after and go, oh, I really feel bad, obviously. The way that he worded it didn't sound like I'm trying to be mean. He sounded like I'd hurt him, really, is what it sounded like, this yeah. particular person. Then you click on the profile and it's like three blurry images and one of them's of like a cat. It's like, <laughs> oh, I, I, it's a spam profile that happened to have asked a really pricky question that kind of got to me. So, yeah, yeah. I just- the overreaction factor of a bad comment is something I still don't deal with very well. I go into like full meltdown. <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of right there with you. I yeah. don't deal too well with one out of 10 negative comments and it will get to me. Mm. It, it may not be the most, may not ruin my day, but there have been times where I've gotten a comment where I just get furious and I just, I, I can't record today. I am so effing angry I can't actually make a video because I will just scream into the camera and nobody wants that. 
<laughs> that would be unfair to the microphone. It would be unfair to anybody listening. So yeah. I'm just going to take a step back. So yeah, yeah, everybody deals with it. I still deal with that too. There's nothing wrong with that. That's We're humans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if people want to go out there, Bandrew, and they want to see a human, a real live human, he's right in front of me right now, other side of the world, but we're... This is happening in real time in space. This is a moment. Yes, I am a human. Thank you yes, for thank you. confirming that. <laughs> yes, he's, the voice has started to fade a bit here at the end. <laughs> the shield's coming down. <laughs> if people want to go and see you talk about microphones or just talk about the internet in general and YouTube, where can people do that stuff? And do you have any projects underway that you're particularly excited about at the moment? Yeah, there are, I'll give you two websites. The first one is podcastage.com. That's spelled podcastage.com. It's where you can find all of my audio gear coverage. And then just go to bandrewscott.com. That has links to everything. That is my podcast. It has personal videos that I upload. It has music videos when I upload those. And you can find all of my links and all the content there. Excellent. And I finally, in the last maybe 12 months, my iOS devices have worked out that bandrew is a word I want to type. It's, it's not a different word. It's not Andrew Scott. It's Andrew Scott. Thank you, iOS. That's why I'm not scared of AI at the moment, because I can't even get predictive text right. Yeah, I think we're safe for a few more yeah. decades. Yeah, I think so. So The Bandrew silence Scott, aren't, aren't rising up yet. Well, it depends on what they look like. I'll take the, the more modern version of the silence. Yeah. Yeah, so say we all. Yeah, so say we all. So thank you so much, Andrew, for making the time. I think we got to some of the stuff I wanted to today, but that's kind of how these chats go. We just kind of go where it takes us, which I think sometimes maybe that goes back to my progressive rock roots that I just like to follow the, <laughs> the journey and maybe there's a resolution and maybe there's not. But thank you so much for the time. Bandrewscott.com. Are you using any social media actively enough for people to reach out or would it be easier just to go to the websites? Yeah, just go to the websites. I have social links there, but I'm not too active on them. I'm too busy making the content, making the videos. And there's a lesson just to finish up, everyone. If you're trading time that you could be spending making the thing for trolling on the internet, then getting worried later in the day and posting about how you ran out of time to make the thing, maybe just flip those in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> like, learn from Andrews. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Righto. Well, thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Josh. Absolute pleasure.